Hello everyone, it's Dr. Chumnaris again here from Orlando from Cardiovascular Interventions. And uh, thanks for tuning in. Today, I'm going to talk about diabetes and the effects of diet versus medications, diet versus drugs, to see which one you can really choose. I want to empower you all to make this decision. So, in the September article here in the New England Journal of Medicine, there was a beautiful article here. It says glycemic reduction in type 2 diabetes. And I want to discuss this for with you so that you all can know the effects of diet versus drugs in diabetes. Now, diabetes is a huge problem, especially for cardiologists, because we know that this causes cardiovascular disease, which is the number one cause of death. It causes heart attacks, congestive heart failure, blindness, dementia, proof of vascular disease. And we know that diabetes is on the up. And we know that there's a half a billion people on this planet who have diabetes. This burden is huge. And we know that there's one and a half million new cases of diabetes every year. This is an epidemic. We've never seen this before. Even 40 years ago, we didn't have this type of diabetes. So obviously, we talked about this in my previous um, uh, videos where I said that it is mostly the diet and the lifestyle and what we're eating and how we're eating and how frequently we're eating. And that's the root cause of this problem. And it's happening all over the world. So in this article, they talk about the medications and how good they are for your diabetes. And what I talk about in my previous videos is how good diet is and is in completing completely reversing your diabetes, completely reversing it. So I'm not saying that you shouldn't do drugs. I'm saying that drugs have a place, absolutely, but so does diet, and it's not emphasized. So let me show you some of the data that we came up with. So this was the GRADE study research group, and what they did is that they took a five-year study, they put a lot of patients into it. In fact, there were over 5,000 patients, and these were all diabetic patients. These diabetic patients had a hemoglobin A1C between 6.8 and 8.5. So for those who don't know, hemoglobin A1C is the test that you look to see how good or bad your diabetes is. And you want your hemoglobin A1C to be less than 6.4. And uh, uh, these patients all had diabetes for 10 years, and they studied their hemoglobin A1Cs, but they divided them up into four groups. They all got metformin, which is a medication for diabetes. And then one group got insulin in addition to metformin. The second group got a GLP-1 receptor agonist. That's a group of drugs that they use for diabetes. And then another group got glimepiride plus metformin. And the last group uh, got citagliptin, which is also a diabetes medication. And there's a whole group of those. So there's basically four groups of medications plus metformin. So they combine the medications to see if it made much difference and which combination is the best combination. So when they studied these over five years, the goal was to make sure the hemoglobin A1C came down to less than seven. And remember, I think that it should be less than 6.4, 6.5. But they said, okay, less than seven, all right. But the results showed that 71% of the participants did not reach a hemoglobin A1C less than seven using this combination of medications. So any reduction in your hemoglobin A1C is of course good, but if it's not coming down to less than seven, can I really call that good diabetes control? No, I don't. Thousands of patients around the world have been doing my diet. They're doing intermittent fasting. They're watching what they're eating and staying away from preserved foods. They go with whole foods only. And they have had dramatic reductions in their diabetes and not only that, the A1Cs come down to less than 6.5. Thousands of patients. So let's look at the study even more. Okay. What's worse is that those who started out with a hemoglobin A1C of 6.8 on medicines, those who started out with a hemoglobin A1C of 6.8, what happened to them? Majority of them progressed and went even higher during the test. So overall, less than 7%, less than 7% of these patients actually kept the hemoglobin A1C less than what they started out with. So less than 7%. This is the goal in that study, and yet it was not achieved in most of the patients. 
the overall reduction in the hemoglobin A1C with the medicines was 0 0.3. A 0 0.3 reduction in your hemoglobin A1C. Progression of disease, A1C overall less than 0.3, no major difference between any of the combinations. So yes, the study did show a small reduction in the hemoglobin A1C. Some combinations were slightly better than others. And I think that the GLP-1 receptor agonist reduction was probably because of weight loss. But we don't have that specific in the data in the, in the article over here. But I want you to share something else with you. The adverse effect rates were all greater than 30%. That means 30% of patients in each group, more than 30%, had side effects. Weight gain was between 9% and 13% of the patients all had weight gain. Weight gain instead of weight reduction. And GI symptoms, at least 30 to 35% of the patients got GI symptoms on the medications. So what I'm saying is that, yes, the study did show a small reduction in hemoglobin A1C, but am I happy with that? And says, no, there was progression of disease instead of curing the disease process. My dietary programs, which you all have heard about, means no concentrated sugars, no concentrated simple carbohydrates, no high fructose corn syrup, no processed foods, no refined products. Because these are the things that cause that intense insulin secretion in the body and causes insulin resistance. So when you don't secrete excessive amounts of insulin, you will not get insulin resistance. So you prevent insulin resistance by cutting down on the sugar. You have to cut down on sugar. And you know, some patients come to me and they say, oh no, I have to be on so many carbs, simple carbs. I'm a diabetic. Why? You do not need simple carbs if you're a diabetic because you're simply going to stimulate more insulin production in the body. Type 2 diabetes is hyperinsulinemia. Too much insulin production because you have insulin resistance. The way you make yourself sensitive to insulin again is by changing your diet so that you're not stimulating your body to make so much insulin, by eating foods that are more complex carbohydrates, lots of fiber in them, whole foods, no processed foods, no refined products, no powdered stuff, no ground up stuff, real food that when you swallow it and eat it and goes down, that real food will not cause a tremendous surge in your insulin. Why? Because it's mixed with the fiber, because the soluble fiber forms a mesh around the food molecules so that it does not stimulate the production of insulin because the case cells in the duodenum don't see all that concentrated sugar there. So you get less insulin production. Secondly, the absorption rate is much slower. Thirdly, the whole foods have soluble fiber that go down into your colon, and there, who eats the soluble fiber? Who, who digests it? You don't. Your bacteria do. So the good bacteria in your gut consume the soluble fiber, and they produce short-chain fatty acids. And these short-chain fatty acids, they improve the health of the lining of your intestines, and more mucus production, so you get less intestinal permeability and less immune stimulation, and the short-chain fatty acids are also anti-inflammatory, and they improve insulin resistance. So by reducing the amount of insulin production by choosing the right types of foods at the upper end, you're producing less insulin through the hormonal production, and then your bacteria, by consuming the fiber, the fiber that's missing in processed foods. Well, what, what is a processed food? A processed food is one in which the fiber has been removed. A refined food is one in which there is no fiber. You see, there's two issues with processed foods. One is that there's no fiber in it. It's been taken out. And number two, they've added other things into it. Like what? Preservatives, colorings, taste. But you really don't need those things. Who's going to need it? It's not a nutritional requirement, but it's put there so that it's highly palatable, right? It's highly palatable, so you're going to buy it, you're going to get addicted to the taste. We talked about that in my other videos. But the real food that you really need is not just for you. 
in the upper part of your intestines, you'll absorb the sugar and carbohydrates and you'll absorb the proteins and some vitamins. But then the fiber is what you really need to feed your other buddies, your bacteria. So remember that there are 10 trillion human cells, but there's 100 trillion bacterial cells inside your intestines. Now these bacteria are not there just having fun. They're there for a real reason. Because they're there because they have a symbiotic relationship with you and they produce chemicals, which in turn you absorb and helps you. So, you know, when I was in college, I used to say to my professors, how does fiber really help you? And the answer was, oh, you get big bulky stools and therefore, you know, all the toxins get out there and you don't get constipated. And that. that's fine, but does it really affect your physiology? And now we're knowing that it does affect your physiology. So what happens is that these bacteria are not just sitting there. They actually consume the fiber and produce short-chain fatty acids and a ton of other molecules. And by the way, they are also the ones that consume all your polyphenols and other things which we know are good for us. But it's not for us. It's for the bacteria. You're eating for yourself and your bacteria. So with the dietary program that I've recommended, which means eating whole foods, eating infrequently, so you're not eating every three or four hours. You're doing intermittent fasting, you do time-restricted feeding, and a lot of videos on these. And with this, you get a sudden change in the physiology due to a combination of less insulin production, more anti-inflammatory molecule production through short-chain fatty acids in the gut, and you're changing your entire microbiome, you're feeding them, and then the fasting itself has an effect on the microbiome as well as sensitivity to insulin. So it's a win-win all around. And when you think about it, this is how your body was supposed to be. You eat, you feast, then you fast. You feast and the fast. And from thousands of testimonials, thousands of them, people have reversed diabetes completely. Not just get a hemoglobin A1C down less than point, less 5.3. I think a 0.3 reduction is, is not enough. Not enough for me. It's not enough for my patients. I want to completely reverse your diabetes. If you are overweight, if you have diabetes, if you have complications of diabetes particularly, you have to look at medicines. Yes, talk to your doctor. Talk to him about the medicines. Find out which one's going to be suitable for you. You're not going to get side effects. Remember, a third of them cause side effects. But you have to change your diet. And once you get your insulin sensitivity back, you get your weight back to weight, ideally where it should be, and you've restored your sensitivity, your body will be completely completely different than it was before. And the mechanisms of action, I've gone over some of them. I'm going to make more videos on this. I hope you enjoyed this. So remember, drugs are helpful, but diet, nutrition tops all drug therapies. Much better. You've got to do both. It's the diet that really works. If you like this video, please click thumbs up, and I'll see you again on our next journey. Take care. If you liked this video, here's one that I would recommend. And if you want to see my latest video, please click here.